Welcome to today's SCA webinar with poor pressure, poor and geopressure prediction framework and applications for exploration and production with Dr. Salim Shaker. Uh, before we start today's webinar, we're going to ask a few questions about the demographics of the audience. So I'm going to share the first polling question. And the question is, what is your primary discipline? So you should see those options available for voting. The responses are coming in now. It looks like we have quite a few geoscientists in the audience. Good split between geoscientists and petrophysicists. That seems to be the majority so far. Votes are still coming in. Please give us your primary technical discipline. About half of you have voted so far. It's 50-50 between the geoscientists and the petrophysicists. A few more votes coming in. I see we have a few petroleum engineers in the audience. Geoscientists are still in the lead with 58%, followed closely by petrophysicists and petroleum engineers. Not all of you have voted yet. Getting a few more votes, still a strong majority of geoscientists. So we've got about 80% now, so I'm going to close and share the results. 60% geoscience, 27% petrophysics, and 13% petroleum engineers. So our next question is, how many years of full-time experience do you have in the upstream oil and gas industry? So we're getting our responses now. Quite a few of you have over 30 years. And quite a few of you are in the 11 to 20 year group. How many years of experience do you have in the upstream oil and gas industry? Well, a remarkably even spread so far, but none have less than one year. Everybody has at least one year of experience. So it looks like most of you have uh, given us your results at this point. So 33% are in the 11 to 20 year range, followed closely by the 21 to 30 year range. But we also have a good 20% each in the 1 to 10 and the over 30 year range. So thank you for that. So I'm going to share my desktop. And um, before I introduce Salim Shaker, I'd like to remind the audience that you are muted. Uh, you can ask questions during the presentation using the GoToWebinar feature, and we'll cover the Q&A at the end of the presentation. And you will be anonymous, so feel free to ask your questions. So let's see. So you are at today's webinar on poor and geopressure prediction framework and applications for ENP. And our speaker is Dr. Shalim Shaker. Salim has quite a bit of experience. He started his career in Egypt and he has worked with um, assets around the world. He's well published with many uh, technical papers and articles. He teaches to multiple professional groups and he's also a instructor for SCA. He's been the chair of several conferences and workshops, and he's the winner of the Atwater Award for his paper on a new approach to poor pressure prediction Gulf of Mexico. So the course that relates to this webinar today is Poor Pressure, Fracture Pressure, and Well Bore Stability. That's being offered November 9th through 11th here in Houston, Texas in SCA's office. Also want to remind you about upcoming live online classes. We've got uh, Dr. Christine Economides and Dr. Demetrius Hazignatu that will be teaching carbon capture utilization and storage and engineering perspective. And the next free webinar in our webinar series is Leslie Wood on exploring ancient landscapes, seismic geomorphology. That's November 1st. So remember, 
SCA courses can also be taught in-house, so please contact us if you would be interested in having one of these courses in-house. And of course, in addition to training, SCA offers consulting, uh, direct hire services for both full-time and uh, contract uh, workers and uh, projects and studies. And so I am going to provide the uh, presentation rights to Salim. And Salim, I'll remind you to turn on your webcam, please. Okay, we see your go to webinar screen. We don't see your slides yet. There we go. You see my slides? We see your slides, but we still don't see your webcam. Hold on, let me let me see where okay. can I get that webcam. There we go. It is in okay, there you go. Okay, and you probably want to put your slides in presentation mode. You see my webcam? We see your webcam, yes. All right, good. So and put your slides in presentation mode, please. There we go, we're all set. Can you see me clearly? Yes, looks good. Well, thank you, Susan, for the nice introduction. And thanks everybody who's gonna spend some time with me, like half an hour or more, it depends on attending this webinar. This is a an introduction to that course coming up in November the 9th. This course about poor and view pressure. The reason I The reason I split that title to poor and due pressure because poor pressure is not always due pressure. So uh, that's what I thought to do it that way. So we in the class, we're going to go through this. I call it the prediction framework because the class, the common class, is not about teaching how to pick the shale points, how to draw a compaction line, how to calculate overburden. I noticed some of you have more than 20 years experience, the audience, I mean. So you are familiar with the pressure, how we calculate pressure, and probably most of you have a software uh, mostly drill work, and I, I did work with, with drill work like 20 years ago when it started. And uh, the course in November is going to concentrate on manipulating all these data we collect. If we have petrophysical data or geomechanical data or hydrodynamic data, we're going to combine them to get together and we come up with a poor pressure profile just to fit our geological setting. And we'll see that in the snapshots coming up. But if you attend to the course, you're going to see all the details. What is poor pressure and what is geo pressure? We need porosity, fluid, and stress. It is the fluid. We have three, four grains here. We got a little pore in between. We're going to add stress to it. The first thing come to mind is overburden. 
then the two other stresses and probably we're going to add tectonic as well so the the fluid inside that pore or the space doesn't like that stress coming from both sides other sides and they fight back the the fluid fighting back the stress that's what we get the pressure so you got a rock mechanic here you got poor pressure they again is to each other one going inward one going out so poor pressure that's why i split the title can be normally hydrostatically pressured watch that static it's not moving or can be hydrodynamic it means the fluid is moving or can be due pressure due pressure has has to be static it's not moving and has to be over pressure means it has a larger value than the normal hydrostatic that's just a, a simple definition to poor pressure and geopressure. The geological building blocks that has to go in your system. Whatever software you use, either drill work or any other ones, I'm familiar with drill work, has to go in. Sedimentation go first. That's the geological part of sedimentation. Add load, you get that overburden. And those two contribute to the vertical stress. Vertical stress contribute to increase the port pressure. And when the vertical stress increase, the basin start doing subsidence or going down and they try to accommodate for the incoming sediments when they accommodate for the incoming sediments you have that minimum horizontal stress maximum horizontal stress change what is what this is gonna do this is gonna impact the bore hole stability so looking for the geology first if you are in a subsidence or subsiding basin see where is this versus this to predict where is the poor hole instability is going to take place on the tectonic part that's part of the geology you got regional you got basin scale including stratigraphy diaprism interaction between the salt and the sediment and when we get to the prospect itself not in the basin okay we're going smaller for regional basin scale and prospect prospect we go to the structure relief and the faults that's how we customize call it customize your pressure profile so this is my little model here and i have published this in the otc here is your shell platelets compaction. Here is come loosely from the deposition and system and start compacted. Here you get a seal, start gathered together, form a seal, and here your overpressure system. Here is Terzaghi idea. And if we take the porosity, that's what it looks like. Here, all the porosity here act as exponential. So the pore pressure, exponential as well. We call this compaction equilibrium, call this compaction disequilibrium. The most of pore pressure or the geo pressure system form as the disequilibrium means you add load to the sediments or to the basin and the fluid cannot escape that's what they call it equilibrium 
this is the model. I'm taking the porosity here and replace it with the petrophysical properties, the velocity. They came up with the same thing. If you use the normal scale, you come up with exponential trend. If you go with the log scale, you go with a linear scale. It just the exponential and the logarithmic, they are cousins. And we're going to learn that in the class, how we convert from exponential to logarithmic and how we manipulate the data to do this. However, it doesn't matter what kind of source the pressure comes from. You have to have a seal. If you don't have a top seal and any, of any kind, that pressure will dissipate either to the surface or to another compartment. The course will go from the known to the prediction or the unknown or the predict predictable pressure. So you get known, which is measured, that's in the sand. And we're going to go through the course to explain why the pore pressure profile take a cascade shape going from shale, sand mixture, under compaction. It has a gradient and go to a cascade behavior. This is because compartmentalization. So if we take this, the sand always in a linear form, shale in exponential form. So if we take this and convert it to a pressure plot, that's what we're gonna see. Any pressure plot you come up with, it has to have the hydrostatic, the overburden or the principal stress and the shale predicted pressure and the sand measured pressure. And do not mix both of them. Predicted pool pressure and measured, pre measured pool pressure does not mix. This is one of the infamous problem in our discipline. Mix up the measured pool pressure in the sand with the predicted pool pressure in the shield. They are separate and they are not supposed to match each other all the time. Otherwise, we not have any problem whatsoever to drill any well. So we go in, in the course, we go in from the known or the measured pool pressure. From the measured pool pressure, we're going to learn compartmentalization. Different compartments in the subsurface. Some of these compartments is progression. They go on forward. Some of them, they return or they trade back due to faults or some other, other things. Salt. That's what we're going to learn. We'll learn how, how they go progressive or regressive. The best practice for calculate the gradient. I have seen a lot, or we seen, and you guys seen a lot of gradient miscalculation. We're gonna go through that in the course as well. How we convert the pressure in the reservoirs from PSI to PPG is the centroid concept valid or not valid? The hydraulic head, the impact of the hydraulic head on exploration and production sealing capacity we have to have a seal to have hydrocarbon we all looking for hydrocarbon that's why we try to survive making money sell the oil and make money so we need the seal if you don't have the seal you don't have the resources and then 
a lot of pull pressure profiles I have seen and we practice, they do not add the impact of the hydrocarbon column to the pull pressure profile. And this is, this is some of the hazards in exploration. You have to add the hydrocarbon column effect on the pore pressure profile. Otherwise, you're going to hit that column and you're going to have a hard kick. That's an example that we're going to go in the course in details why our pore pressure goes positive when in the PSI go negative when we convert it to a PPG. And what is the source of this? Because we got mixed up between the gradient and the slope. It's different between slope and gradient. And we also gonna discuss the centroid. Is it valid or not valid? It depends. It depends how you believe in it. You believe in it or you don't believe in it. But the results of this, we came up with the geological compaction, uh, the geological uh, conver conversion factor. And instead of that, the pore pressure, when you turn it to PPG, this PPG comes negative, we can turn it positive. This is also in the course. Now we go from the reservoirs or the sands where we can measure the pore pressure. Now we go into the shale or the seals and we're going to predict pore pressure. How we predict pore pressure? Either from empirical graphs, that's in the good old days, or the effective stress theorem or equations. And now we all, all of us, we use the effective uh, stress theorem. We need the petrophysical properties as velocity, density, what, what, uh, and we are go through the porosity, compaction, fluid compressibility as the source of the geopressure source. And we'll see how they behave together and how that compaction we can measure it, and we can build up a, an equation to give us the geopressure system underneath, since we have the seal here. And when we predict pore pressure, we need to calibrate that pore pressure. The best practice for calibrating the pore pressure and I'm gonna show you how, just a snapshot right here, not here, coming after a couple of slides. This is the most to use the method to predict pool pressure in the shale. The number one was equal, number one is the equal depth, uh, I put it here. So this is Bauer. Number two is Eaton, but the most used, used one is Eaton effect. Salim, we had a break in your audio. The you third one I do prefer. Off. You might it's want to turn off your video. Is except We had a break in your audio. You might want to turn turn off your video to conserve bandwidth. There we go. Yeah, we can't hear you. Hello. Now we can hear you. That's okay. good. Great. Sorry, sorry for the interruption here, and sorry for the 
should break. So we have two methods. The most used one is Eaton. And then we go for Bowers, and this is the four zone. Bowers is F3 exponent. Eaton has one exponent. And mine has one exponent, and that's the only part of mine different than Eaton. It has an extra exponent for predicting the pool pressure in zone B. But I have used Eaton in zone C and D. And that that four zones, it break the system from normal pressure to hydrodynamic pressure, which is the compaction pressure, to geo pressure. So three zones, uh, four zones with three uh, exponents. I'm frozen, huh? Now, what the data we need for pore pressure prediction and frag pressure prediction and borehole instability. All the data we know, principal stress, intermediate, minimum stress, seismic velocity, sonic, whatever we can get our hand on. And for the uh, borehole stability, we need one thing extra is Poisson ratio. I have used my four zone model, which is, is not different than Eaton. It's the same as Eaton, but instead of apply the whole thing on the section from the top to the bottom, you just apply the effective stress on the section below the top of the dew pressure. And we're gonna learn how to do this in the class, no problem. And proven with case history on the Gulf of Mexico, unsure, I have examples from Indonesia, Asia, Egypt, South America, and even Eaton plots. I modified and I show you the examples in the class that as it's just a modification. My method is a modification of Eaton itself. The calibration. Everybody hear me? Hello? Yes, Hello? we can hear you. Okay. We can good. hear you fine. And you see that you see the screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Here is the problem with the calibration. When we calibrate the predicted pool pressure, it's like the green line here. This is delta T taken from LWD and converted to pool pressure using the effective stress. And probably most of you know what the effective stress is. And we come up with this curve. And However, we try to or try to calibrate that green line to the actual pool pressure using the RFT. Here is RFT. This is measured pool pressure in the sand right here. And this is real. This is measured. So we would try to do this, jive that green line to this predicted pool pressure. What's the result? The result is going to be the pool, predicted pool pressure is about 1500 psi higher than the mud weight, and this is impossible. So, calibrating the pool pressure or the predicted pool pressure with the measured pool pressure is one of the infamous way of calibrating the pool pressure. The best way is different things. B 
because we do not predict pool pressure in the sand. But we can predict what the pressure looks like in different tools. Sharon pressure, mud weight and an N, chloride, borehole stability, ECD exponent. All these factors goes in the calibration. It's not the RFT and MD, MD, uh, MDT. So that's an example here. The mud weight in this plot right here and the predicted pool pressure, you call it new method here, is right here. So between the mud weight and the predicted pressure is about four pound per gallon. And this is impossible because somebody tried to jive that data from delta T to match the RFTs. The same thing I show you in the previous example. That's a problem. Let's go to the frac pressure. We predicted frac pressure from using the pore pressure, and we have empirical data gathered from the area, and we calibrate that with the Likov test. We're going to study the difference between Likov test, formation integrity test, and how the formation integrity test sometimes comes short. You see the Likov test here. The integrity test is short a little bit. It's below the LOP. And this is probably will indicate there is a problem at the casing shoe right here. Or we run the Likov test in a sand formation. So it did leak before it reached the LOT line, the one we predicted from our poor pressure prediction profile. Applications, so many applications we're gonna apply and during that course, how to write an AFE, how we can do a before drilling assessment, is it a good prospect or mediocre prospect? Here is the AFE. I remember when I used to uh, uh, write my AFE, me and my geophysicist and uh, petrophysicist. And uh, most of the data going in the AFE come from your pressure plot. This is one of my favorite examples about risk assessment before we drill a well. Here is a salt basin, many salt basin. This side of the basin is a producer. A lot of fields here. The other side is a buster. There's nothing there. Just wet, wet sand. And we're going to go through the the course in details about salt basins. Why salt basin is very complicated because the stresses and the overburden, they don't match and you have a salt perturbation. You got the sediment load coming. You have the salt moving out and you have diaparisma. You have the overload of the sediments in addition to a shear stress. So it's a jungle out there. Here is your principal stress. So we're going to take seven cases or seven models of prediction models and case studies in the salt basin. They appear active versus passive. Ramp, ramps, that's, by the way, salt ramps is the best part to explore for oil and gas. Here is another salt ramp, but it's not good. It's intrusive. 
and salt withdrawal basin is not eh, is not promising. Overhang and canopy is a good good uh, play to find oil and gas. Dairy and clean salt. This is where the salt to the six B trend, the new six B trend. Here is the salt well. We're gonna go through all these models and figure out which one is good, which one is not promising or was disappointing. Borehole stability. We take part of the a cylinder from the ground, rock cylinder from the ground. So the the formation is hollow here, nothing there. So we have to put mud to replace that pressure we took it out or that cylinder of rocks. This is the function of the mud beside removing the cutting and what have you. It is borehole stability. And we have to adjust the mud pressure to keep that borehole intact. Here is predicted pore pressure before we drill the well. This is the predicted pore pressure. Here is the mud weight we're going to use. Of course, has to be a little bit higher than the pore pressure, right? And I give it to uh, mud weight low and then mud weight ha high here. Some of the engineers, they call it the trip margin, which is, it means when you trip out of the hole, you want that mud to hold the pressure inside the borehole. And they call, it is the frag pressure, and we have to stop before we reach the frag pressure. They call it the kick tolerance. Uh, this is the prediction, that's before we drill, but when we drill, it is a different story. If you do not count or we do not count for the hydrocarbon column, that's what we're going to see. We're going to see the mud pressure and the formation pressure overlap on the top of each other. You might have a very hard kick and probably will not be able to control the borehole or the flow out of the borehole. This is the, uh, I seen it, I did it and I seen it in different places and we don't know who's originally decide this is a good display, but it's a good display. We're gonna discuss the difference between the safe mud weight and what happened to the borehole. This is under the borehole stability section under balance and we're going to reach the point where the collapse take place of the borehole and you cannot pull the drill pipes out of the borehole because formation has been collapsed. On the other hand, the overbalance, overbalance you get ballooning and here you reach the point you damage the formation and you get the loss of circulation, completely the loss of circulation. This is not all. This is just a snapshot, very tiny snapshots from the course, going from measurement to prediction to what is, let's think deep and let's modify our software or spreadsheet to fit the geology and the hydrodynamics. Uh, let's, let's remember prediction is before, calibration during. Prediction is in the shale, measurement in the sand. The, the section above the top of the geo pressure is not normally pressured. Compaction trend. That's my favorite part, the compaction trend. That's why I did suggest 
I'm not enforcing anything. I'm suggesting that we need to not use the normal compaction trend, but it's nothing normal about compaction and normal. Compaction means the fluid leaving. So the fluid has a pressure differential from the bottom to the top and is leaving. So it's not normal. And then we have the problem was calibrating the predicted pore pressure with RFTs and MDTs. And then we we just not taken the software as is, and we apply it to every location we're going to drill, every prospect we're going to figure out if it's high risk or low risk. The good part of that class, the output data based on the class know-how. We're going to sit in the class, we know how, can be exported to drill work or any other software. By the way, I was in the knowledge system when I when we put together the drill work software. I'm sorry I took a few minutes extra, but thank you for attending and appreciate it. And I'm waiting for Q and uh, and A. Great. So I want to remind our audience that you're muted, but you can ask questions using the presentation go the go to webinar question feature, and uh, you will be anonymous. After attending today's webinar, you'll receive a link to the recording of today's webinar, an evaluation form, and a link to register for Dr. Shacker's class: Poor Pressure, Fracture Pressure and well bore stability. And that's scheduled for November 9th through 11th in Houston, Texas. Uh, Dr. Shager also teaches two other classes for SCA. There's four safe drilling, formation, fracture, pressure, interpretation, and analysis. And there's also a class called seal and reservoir pressures analysis for ENP prospects risk. You'll find information about those two classes on our website. So, Celine, the first question is, if you could explain a little bit more about cascade behavior. I think you referred to that on slide six. Uh, yes, interesting. What happened here? I will expand on this. It's supposed to be in the class, but I will expand on it. See, that part of the section here, that loosely, sediments does not start compaction yet and then the second part of the section which where the compaction started right here and then you get to a compartmentalization you have a reservoir can you see my my uh do you see the slides Yes, we can see your slides. You might okay. switch the pointer to um, laser mode. You might uh, need no, to be in presentation. Be. Okay, I can do it. Okay, here okay. Go. There you go. Perfect. Okay, now we we goes from compaction to another compartment, which is reservoir, and we agree. And you know that sand reservoir gradient is linear. So they are linear. But between here and the linear part, there is a poor pressure in the shale right there. And we know the shale compact exponentially. That's why we have that equations the Eaton equation and uh, uh, Terzaki that the effective stress apply to. So in the shale, that's exponential trend. So it goes from this point here to this point. That's exponential. This is exponential. And this is linear. 
linear, linear. I do have a lot of slides in the class, but going down, if we, let me go up, okay, here it is. Here is the compaction here. Exponential. You go to the top of the G pressure and everything reverses itself. Delta T reverses itself and the pore pressure increase right there. Okay. So it hit another sand bed and become linear. Get another sand bed and become linear. But between the two sand beds, you have the shale. And the shale is going exponentially. So that's frozen here again. So if you follow that profile here, if you follow the profile here, here is in the shale, it's going exponentially, and in the sand is going linear. That's why it looks like a cascade. And I do have a lot of uh, models, cylinder models. It show this is as a cylinder, water cylinder, and this is a cap between the water cylinder. So I have a model on the class show four cylinders here full of water and then between the cylinders there is a desks or desks between the cylinders and how the cylinders stack on the top of each other and give you that ca cascade shape that's what it is thank you You're the next question is uh, could you discuss the centroid concept Discuss the centroid concept. Okay. This is what the centroids say. Hey, this is not the discussion. Is uh, is it? Is it? viable or not viable i yeah i think the questioner just wasn't familiar with that so if you could explain what does the centroid concept mean the centroid concept is it says that the pore pressure on the top of the reservoir the pore pressure gradient is higher than the top pressure the pore pressure gradient at the bottom of the reservoir you look at it here uh, Okay, let me get that. I think, it, oh man, okay, hold on, hold on. He bear with me, I got a problem with my pen. Oh, laser. The centroids say the top of the reservoir have a high gradient than the bottom of the reservoir. Pressure gradient, right? Because this centroid assume that The mud weight here fan, it is 15 ppg, here is 15 ppg, there's two ppg difference. That, that's what the reservoir looks like, but it's not. It is a hybrid plot. You cannot mix PS, PSI, here is PSI, here is ppg. So I'm gonna go through this in the class because somebody, okay, like this is, this is the, origin of all the problems we have that the pore pressure increase in PSI and decrease 
in PPG. That's what it is right here. Because we mixed, we got mixed up between slopes and gradient. This is the slope and this is gradient. If you have a reservoir and it doesn't matter tilted or not tilted, that reservoir has one gradient. And we see that everywhere. It doesn't have two gradients. Let me show you an example here. Here, this is the reservoir has one gradient and that gradient, the same as the hydrostatic gradient. It is gradient as the hydrostatic gradient. This is real data, it just in PSI. But when you mix the PSI with the PPG, that's why you get that confusion here. Right here. You don't know the slope or gradient. That's why we came up with the geologically conversion factor here. You take that RFT and PSI and you convert it to PPG, it gives you a negative slope. You have to take it back with the PPG to make it increase with depths. Always, doesn't matter in PPG or RFT and PSI, always pressure increase with depth. And this is gonna, here, here, is, here what it is. Here, look at that table here. Depth, PSI, PSI increase with depth. Here is PPG decrease with depth. It is about 13 PPG, it is about 12 PPG. We got in the class, we're gonna go through that exactly how we're gonna fix it. But to justify the centroid, is it valid or not? I have to give you a, a long session and I don't think we have time for it. That's fine. Let's go to the next question. Is there any difference in pore pressure for normal conventional reservoirs and reservoirs having dual porosity? Dual porosity. What do you mean by dual porosity? Such as a carbonate with uh, vugs. With vugs. I like that vugs. <laughs> okay. What do we say here? We need porosity, fluid, and stress. It is the, here is the stress, here is the fluid. Why is it not valid in the carbonate? Because it, the carbonate is missing the elasticity. It doesn't have that compaction disequilibrium. It does not compact, but it has poor pressure. You can generate poor pressure from gas, from uh, diagenesis, the pores, size decrease, and the volume of the, I mean, the, the fluid push against the, the, the pores and generate poor pressure, but it's not coming from compaction. It's coming from different sources. So that's why I say it at the beginning, Poor and poor and geo pressure, and the rock mechanic again is the poor, the poor pressure. So in the carbonate, the rock mechanic and uh, compressibility is not there because you have a very solid skeleton. The same thing like the salt. So um, uh, the compaction disequilibrium apply in the shale or the detrital materials, the classic material, because you do have, let me see if I have it right here, you do have 
here is the platelets here shale platelets you have expelled water coming out of the formation cause the compaction and you have interstitial water this is not leaving at all and you have bound water so even if the water leave you have still have formation water here and this give you the compressibility and give you the idea of the effective stress over burden minus the pp because you have elasticity here you have compressibility but in the limestone you have a very hard skeleton rock i don't know if this is answer your question yes thank you i think we're near the top of the hour today so uh, we appreciate all of our questions from the audience we'd like to thank you for attending today's webinar and later today thank you'll you. receive a link to the recording of today's webinar an evaluation form and a link to register for poor pressure fracture pressure and will bore stability that's scheduled for november 9th through 11th in houston texas with dr salim shakur thank you thank you goodbye thank you susan